Uh, we'll go ahead and start by setting our motivation. So just take a minute and get yourself into uh, Dharma talk headspace. Sangye chudam soge chunam hai janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki rola penche sangye drupa sho sangye chudam soge chunam hai janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki Rola penje sange drupa sho sange churon soge churon la janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chenyan ki pe sonam ki rola penje sange drupa sho and just taking a minute to connect with that motivation deeply in your own mind All right, so um, I really like to thank Land of Joy for hosting me. They're um, really a beautiful group of people, really amazing center. So if you haven't been here before, I really recommend it. It's pretty special. Um, the text that we're gonna be looking at today, The Wheel of Sharp Weapons is meant for advanced students. It's meant for people, not necessarily advanced in terms of their scholastic knowledge, but advanced in terms of their spiritual maturation. So you need to make sure that you're hearing this with a very nuanced view, because to read the verses on the surface, and maybe some of you have read them many times, they're full on. And it sounds very um, punitive and punishing and judgmental and harsh. And actually there's threads of humor and invitations for self-reflection and connection to the human condition and all sorts of ways to cultivate bravery. And not just kind of this courageous bodhisattva attitude that takes hardships on the path, but also is understanding karma from a different lens than normally. So this is a fundamentally Mahayana practice. So because it's Mahayana, you know that the goal is complete Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient things. Okay, so when you're looking at karma in this context, you're not looking at it as just an impetus to practice ethics, although that is there. You're looking at it also as an impetus to destroy the self-cherishing attitude. And that's another one of those words that if you're not hearing it with a nuanced view, sounds super harsh, like you're not allowed to take care of yourself. In fact, it elevates the way you take care of yourself to understand the demon of self-cherishing, right? So I think some of you know this, but we just wanna make sure we're on the same page because when you read the verses, they are so full on. And I don't want anyone to revert into some old, I don't know, fundamentalist upbringing that they might have had full of, you know, self-flagellation and all sorts of sort of harshness and, uh, I don't know, feeling like Zeus is going to send down lightning bolts and destroy you if you're naughty or something, whatever, paternal, whatever associations we have. I want to make sure we hear it with the right ears. So when you hear the word self-cherishing, you want to hear a self that is cherished that is not real. So it's completely related to self-grasping. Self-grasping and self-cherishing are not the same thing, but they are like best friends for us, unfortunately. So the self that is cherished by self-cherishing isn't actually there. There is a self, but it's not that one. The self that is there is that which is merely labeled on the collection of parts, isn't it? But when we're, and that's really what we're trying to understand by overcoming self grasping. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow when we get into the wisdom verses. But when we're looking at overcoming self cherishing, the direct antidote to self cherishing is bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, that good hearted attitude that aspires for Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. So if you're going to work for sentient beings, you need to be healthy, you need to be happy. You need to be strong and stable and have all sorts of inner and outer supports, but not from a clingy, attached mind that's full of, I don't know, entitlement and demandingness and self-centeredness. It's from a strategic perspective of 
I'm a tool to be of benefit to others. I must make sure I'm running smoothly like a good car. <laughs> yes. So with self-cherishing, you can eat as much junk food as you want. With self-cherishing, you can watch as much Netflix as you want because it's just you, it's hurting no one. But without self-cherishing or working on overcoming self-cherishing, you say, I actually can't eat junk food. That's temporary satisfaction. I have to eat less or no junk food and eat really healthy food so that I'm strong with a sustainable physicality. I can't binge watch TV shows all the time because even if it's just for me, it's kind of putting half pause on my mental afflictions or dissociating myself or making myself somehow a little bit entertained. It's not causing any trouble. But if I'm working for sentient beings, all of those hours are me not working for sentient beings. And what's more, I have to process everything that I've seen, good, bad, ugly, whatever. So your brain has all this extra work to do. And then you wonder why you can't remember any Dharma. You're too full. So it's not about saying I am bad and must stop these things. It's more about filling your life with things so much so that the little bad habits that don't cause trouble that no one would fault you for, but you know are costing you momentum on the path, fall away naturally. So rather than triggering like a deprivation mentality of all the things you're no longer allowed to do now that you're an aspiring bodhisattva, don't do that. Fill your heart with so much of the joyful work that you're doing and those habits gradually fade. And that's a better approach both psychologically and logistically is to feel so full those habits drop away, not to take away those things and then just be left with so much spare time without any idea how to fill it in a productive way. And then feel all kind of panicky with all of this space and, you know, fill it with, I don't know, something that seems healthy like exercise but then you do too much of it and it becomes your whole project and your whole life becomes about getting this body in order and you're going to die anyway. You know, so it's, it's about being really mature and skillful about the way that you approach those negative habits that no one would blame you for. Do you know what I mean? There's plenty of negative habits people do blame us for, like we're too critical and judgmental or we're too impatient or grumpy pants in the morning or whatever. Those are, you know, things your friends and family have noticed. But there's all these little subtle ones that interrupt our momentum on the path and make it harder for us to keep going and keep the joy of it because we start something positive and then we drop it and it takes all of this effort to kind of get back to where we were. If you just never stop, but it's a gentle, quiet, humble pace, you don't have that same interrupted momentum. Is it making sense? So it's almost like you need to underestimate your abilities so that they're sustainable. Sometimes we make a plan for our practice, how we can practice on our best day when in fact we need to think about how we practice on our worst day and do that practice as the bare minimum every single day, rather than a giant amazing practice and then nothing for three weeks and then a giant amazing practice and then nothing for three weeks. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's this kind of maturity that says, if someone were to look at my practice, they would not be impressed. They see me sitting for five minutes in the morning with my motivation and then 10 minutes on shamatha and then a little Lama rim prayer and that's it and it's less than half an hour and if anyone were to watch me they'd say that's it all these years of buddhism and that's your whole practice huh but you know it took years of trial and error of pushing too hard too fast and then letting it go completely and doing nothing and fiddling and playing with your practice in a million ways to get it to sustainable and simple and consistent. Yeah, that actually took a many, many years to get simple and consistent, just like it can take many years to get a good Dharma question. You know, in the beginning, the teacher might say, do you have any questions? And you think, 
well, I'm not totally clear on a number of things, but I can't even formulate a question. I just feel a sea of many concepts to process. So yes, I have questions, but I don't know what they are. And then you know, when you're a Dharma student that as the years go by, eventually you get a nice tidy one sentence question and it took you many years of thought to crystallize it. And then you'll ask it in class and someone might think, wow, that's a really simple question, having no idea of the journey you went through to get to that simple question. So, you know, the Zen Buddhists would say, Zen mind, beginner's mind, right? And there's something deeply mature about that outlook. Yeah, to be brave enough to say you're a beginner, even if you've been practicing your whole adult life. Yeah, and to have that kind of like humorous humility that knows the more you know, the more you realize you don't know anything. Yeah. So um, you as more senior students, I think you can model that kind of bravery in class and just be like, I'm going to ask the dumb question because actually it's not dumb. It took me years to get it this simple. You know, a new student might say something very intellectually fascinating with a great deal of context, right? So much all the whole story behind their question and all the reasons why they're not stupid for asking the question and all the perspectives they're bringing to the question. And you wonder what is even their question? Have you been to Dharma classes like that, right? With like a very smart new person? And you think, look, they've got a good mind, but they haven't sharpened the horns of the dilemma. They haven't figured out what the real confusion in themselves is. They just know that there is confusion and now their pride is feeling reactive about having confusion. So they have to justify their confusion for you know five minutes before they even get to the point. So a mature student can just say, so, okay, karma, cause and effect, yeah, but what about, like, the fact that I have a hangnail? Like, I know it's because I picked my finger. Is that karma or is that not, you know, and it seems like some ridiculous question, but actually it's profound. <clears throat> okay, so with that idea, we're going to jump into the text, and this session is going to be the most chatty session from me, and then we'll have a little stretch. And then we'll do um, some Q&A and some meditation related to it. And after the whole class is finished, I'll send you my, um, my PowerPoint slides if you're curious. So don't feel like you need to frenetically write notes. Um, the main source for the presentation this weekend is going to come from the times that I've studied the Wheel of Sharp Weapons with my teacher, Kensa Rinpoche Geshe Tashi Sering, in the basic program at Chenrezig Institute. Um, I did it once with him for about six to eight weeks in 2002, and, then, uh, and again in about 2006, and then it just became such a love that um, I keep returning to it, and there's actually a lot of great resources like Geshe Nawan Darge's commentary. So Geshe Nawan Darge's commentary is going to inform some of the presentation, as well as Geshe Lundrup Sopa's book, The Peacock in the Poison Grove. For newer students to mind training, there's another text called Just Good Karma by Tupton Children. And you might not realize that it's a commentary on Wheel of Sharp Weapons, but it is. So Geshe Nawan Darge, Geshe Lundrup Sopa, Tupton Children's books are fantastic. And I can send you a little reading list later. All right, here we go. All right, so the premise of Wheel of Sharp Weapons falls under this category of lojang thought transformation, mind training teachings. So it's the same category as like the eight verses of thought transformation by Geshe Langri Tampa. It's the same category as all of these texts that kind of encourage a brave outlook on how you approach your relationships, your life and your karma. And as I said before, they're for very mature students whether scholastically very informed or not, it's about people who have ripened their mind stream to be able to see subtlety and layers and not take verses on their face value, but penetrate the depths and the layers and all the things in between the lines. So Lo Zhang is the category of teaching that we're talking about. Pretty much all Lo Zhang emphasizes Tong Len which is the giving and taking practice that a lot of you will know about. What are you giving? You're giving happiness and roots of virtue. 
What are you taking? You're taking suffering and its causes, your own and others. In, and when you do this, this is the first one that is very easily misunderstood. And the giving and taking practice is to overcome self-cherishing and to increase cherishing others. So in its simplest form, giving is connecting with love, taking is connecting with compassion. And these two ideas kind of pivot back and forth. They eventually ride on the breath. They eventually accompany a visualization. And every cycle of breath visualization and thought, we think weakens the self-cherishing thought and frees up and expands our good heart of bodhicitta, which is in its aspirational stage, but is still able to be connected with. So Lo Zhang emphasizes Tonglen, which develops Jantu Kisem or bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. So bodhicitta is sometimes called the mind of enlightenment or the spirit of enlightenment or the heart of enlightenment. But what it is, is the altruistic mind that seeks enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. So it's, an upgrade from, quote, mere nirvana liberation. And there are two bodhicittas described in Lojong texts, conventional and ultimate. You'll also see a aspiring and engaging conversation. We're not going to go into that in this weekend. Aspiring and engaging bodhicitta are related to conventional bodhicitta. That's more a conversation that lives in the realm of talking about the bodhisattva vows and the path of the six perfections, things like that. So we're talking about conventional and ultimate bodhicitta, which are related to the two aspects of reality, conventional reality and ultimate reality, and how to practice in response to each. So Lojong practice describes both, but which comes first will vary by the author. Usually ultimate bodhicitta comes second, but not always. So this text um, is in the thought transformation Lojong tradition of Buddhism, though it was composed much earlier than the other texts of that tradition. So it predates the eight verses of, of thought transformation. Um, you can find references, early references to, to thought transformation in Nagarjuna's Precious Garland, and in Shantideva's Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life, but they weren't necessarily classed as a genre so distinctly in that time. So this text came from an Indian master, Dharmarakshita. Some people say Indonesian, somewhere in the end of the 10th century, beginning of the 11th century. And he was known for his great compassion and his Tonglen practice. And then the practice was popularized by Dharmarakshita's famous student, Atisha. So Atisha was attributed to founding the Lom Rim tradition. For example, his text, Lamp of the Path. And Atisha passed it to his Tibetan student, Dom Trumpa. So Dom Trumpa, one of the Kadampageshis, is perhaps who initially wrote it down as it appears to originate in the Tibetan having been orally transmitted prior to that point. So despite it being an Indian or some say Indonesian text, um, it wasn't written down in that language. It was an oral tradition until it kind of moved into Tibet where it was written down. So in the text, there are a few main themes that repeat again and again and again. And these analogies or metaphors this poetry is try to conjure up a more kind of visceral experiential connection with the heart of Lojong. So the imagery is powerful and beautiful and interesting, but at some point, some people will kind of take it a bit too literally and get lost in the analogy of it and, not, and miss the point of it. <clears throat> so if any point you're looking at these different references, like the peacock, like the wheel of sharp weapons, like the crow, like the poisonous plant, and you think, yes, but scientifically, blah, 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 that could all possibly be true, but don't get hung up in the literalness. We're looking into the experientialness of things. So the very first thing we're looking at is 
the Wheel of Sharp Weapons itself, because the name of this work is the Wheel of Sharp Weapons or the Wheel Weapon Mind Training or the Wheel of Sharp Weapons effectively striking the heart of the foe. What is the Wheel of Sharp Weapons? And historically, there's a few opinions about whether it's referring to something like a throwing star or if it's referring to something like a chakram, whether a wheel that is made of weapons or a wheel that is a weapon. But in either case, we're talking about something that behaves like a boomerang. So it's analogous to our past actions being related to our current experience. Negative karmic seeds ripen as current suffering experienced. What we did comes back to us behaving like a boomerang. So the first uh, example we see of this framework in the text is verse 11. And it says, depressed and forlorn, when we feel mental anguish, this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning, full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Till now, we have deeply disturbed the minds of others. Hereafter, let's take on this suffering ourselves. Okay, so when you read a verse like this, it sounds like it's saying, depression is your fault. Just deal with it, just bear it. You are crap, you've been mean to people, you've upset them, just take it. And that is not what's being said, not whatsoever, okay? So how not to think is I am bad and should be punished or others are bad and should be punished, which I realize sounds very simplistic, but when you read this, it can sound like that's what it's saying. We also don't wanna think my pain is my fault and I deserve pain. Also others pain is their fault and they deserve pain. Don't think like this, okay? And it seems very obvious, but we do hear Dharma students talk in these terms a little bit, yeah? That when something negative happens, it's either your fault, you deserve it, or you're bad. Or when bad things happen to other people, we're nice to them on the surface, but kind of quietly or secretly or in gossip with our friends are kind of having an inner diabolical cackle that says, yeah, they brought it on themselves. Yeah, and this is not how to think. We also don't wanna think this is fate or destiny. Do not think it is inevitable and out of my control. This is not the way to view karma, okay? So how to think the difficulty I'm experiencing has a cause. It's not random or out of nowhere. And you're thinking in this way because it's true, it's related to karma, that it also helps you become more empowered about your life, that you're not just some victim of circumstance, that you're not just kind of being blown randomly hither and thither, that there's not something that is kind of nihilistic about the way things happen, that everything has a cause. And if you don't like the causes, then stop creating them. It becomes very proactive. So you think my life is a series of causes and effects as I see in the natural world. Some of those causes and effects are very obvious and direct. Some of those causes and effects are far more subtle and from farther in the past and beyond our memory. But this is what our life is, is a series of causes and effects. So we approach these ideas with how do I change the trend? So what is happening now relates to the past. How I respond creates my future. This is the basic karma conversation that you've probably heard many times, but in the middle of some sort of mental angst or anguish, in the middle of some sort of physical difficulty, in a logistical nightmare, in a relationship breakdown, do we think this is the ripening result of my past? And if I respond well, that karma finishes and I don't create more of the same? We only think to remember that sometimes. So 
depressed and forlorn when we feel mental anguish. This is really the human condition, isn't it? It's not talking about the fact that some people have clinical depression and some people don't. All of us get depressed. It just depends on the duration, the depth, the regularity, but we all have versions. It's a spectrum. And when we feel this, there are so many things we can think. One is the cause of this is having disturbed the minds of others. So do I still do that? It's something to sit with. So if we take this verse 11 as our kind of conversation starter, we think about what does it mean to disturb the minds of others? Because aren't others responsible for their own minds and their own reactions? Yes, you should all think, yes, yes, they are. They're responsible for their own minds. They're responsible for their own reactions and responses. Um, we cannot inject someone with a mental state, good or bad. Okay, that's true. And we also are grown up people who have lived a certain amount of time and realize that humanity responds to certain things in patterns that are predictable. It doesn't mean they're inherent, it doesn't mean they're inevitable, but if you shout at someone, usually it hurts them. Not from its own side, not in all contexts, not divorced from context, right? All of these things that you know, but you do know, classically, people don't like that, <laughs> right? So you say to yourself, I did not inherently give someone a, dis a, a disturbed mind, but my behaviors, I knew better. I knew I was a condition for their suffering. Now, if they'd never created the cause, I can't just magically make them suffer. But most of us have created the cause for shouting to be a condition to ripen the past negative seed into pain in this moment. So from your side, you think, I will not be a condition for other people's negative karma to ripen. It's not inevitable for negative karma to ripen. It has to meet with conditions. Most of those conditions are your own internal state, but some of them are the outer experience. So when someone shouts at us, we know we can practice patience, we can practice lojong, we can practice loving kindness, we can remember karma, we can remember emptiness. We got all sorts of tools in our tool belt if someone shouts at us. We can think suffering people have bad behavior. So when there's bad behavior, I see that they're suffering. Classics. That's not the conversation we're having. The conversation we're having is what do we do? Yeah, what do we do to others? So you experience suffering and you think, when have I created a cause for this in this very life, in this very year, in this very week, month, or day? Because it's very likely, if it's something that happens a lot, that you're still creating causes for it. And if you hate the effect, stop creating the cause. So you just kind of take a little bit of a step back without a self-punishing attitude and ask yourself, I wonder how my behavior affects people. Sounds so basic, doesn't it? But I mean, how many of us really sit and think about it? We hope that other people do, right? We hope that other people, when they have terrible choices in traffic, think, don't they know the effect on people when they cut them off? Don't they know the weaving in between traffic makes everyone freaked out? Don't they know? Maybe, maybe not, but look at your own driving, right? Right? Look at your own driving. Like, is going too slow frustrating everyone behind you? Is going too fast freaking them out? Is, you know, weaving in the lane a little bit making people nervous? Are you creating the condition for an accident? You know, as an adult driver, you need to watch your own driving. And if you judge other people's driving, it's for a moment and then come back to watch your own wheel. And that's the way we need to be thinking in life is actually we don't know other people's motivations. We don't know people's spectrum of suffering. All we can do is make an educated guess about our own and try to navigate that in a way that is less harmful. So if we're on this bodhisattva path, we sit down and we think, all right, so workplace snapshot. Who do I engage with in my work life? How do I engage with them? What are their responses? Does it seem like actually my verbal patterns are more abrasive than I realized. 
you know, it's much easier to notice this if you're coming into a different culture or with new people. But old people, what you've seen for years, you get into kind of an autopilot or you start to take it for granted that everything you do and say is fine. But, you know, I mean, even think about your spouse or your kids or your best friend is how you speak to them imbued with skillfulness and compassion. Yeah, you think, well, I have compassion for them. Sure, you might. But what are your actions doing in terms of being a condition for them? So this can be really complicated because you can slip into codependence. You can slip into getting really neurotic. You can slip into needing validation all the time. Like, did I hurt your feelings? Am I good? Am I good? Please tell me I'm good. Do you like me? You don't say it like that. You're not a child, but you do all sorts of little like grown-up person manipulations to try and elicit validation to make sure that you're doing it right. So don't slip. This is just an inner conversation with yourself of, was that my best work verbally, <laughs> based on what I know so far? Was that my best work physically, based on what I know so far? And if it wasn't, just think about that. How come? Was I just lazy? Or was I just tired? Or was I actually not up to my best? Be nice to yourself about it without excuses, without justification, without that slippery slope. So you start to see how these are very mature concepts. These are not conversations you wanna have with a child unless it's a very precocious, mature child who is already showing symptoms of thinking in this way already, right? You don't think, oh, if you're depressed, honey, do you know it's because you disturb the minds of others? Would you say that to a child? That would be so mean, that would be so harsh right? Would you say that to a new Buddhist? No. Would you say that to someone with clinical depression who is having the symptoms of clinical depression in that moment? No, <laughs> right? You say it to yourself on a good day when you've got mental space to explore it. So question, question so far, the wheel. Thoughts so far? Is it, is it making sense or yeah? Yeah, are there pitfalls that you can see you might slip into or you've seen yourself and others slip into? So I, I have a question. Sure. Um, when um, I've heard about this practice called universalization, and I think it is based on Tonglen, but, or, or maybe not, I'm not sure. I know that it, I think I've read it on probably the Dalai Lama's website or something. So. Um, is this, uh, would that be right to say that, that practice when, when you are um, upset and you understand that that's, you created the causes, um, you sort of like take all the other suffering onto yourself? Would that be right? Would that be like the practice of universalization or... I, I haven't heard that framing, um, but it, it certainly is related to universal responsibility. It's certainly related to this Tonglin practice of giving and taking. When it says, hereafter, I'll take all the suffering onto myself, it's a mental attitude of overcoming resistance, of expanding the heart, of increasing bravery. So what you're thinking is all suffering comes from actions motivated by self-grasping and actions motivated by self-cherishing. That's the enemy. No one is my enemy. My only enemy are these wrong ways of thinking, which are not me, they're completely removable. So they came from the self-cherishing, self-grasping thought. I will give them back to the self-cherishing, self-grasping thought. And that will weaken it and, and open up the heart. So you do that for your own pain, your own suffering, your own anticipated pain and suffering, and then you expand it to all sentient beings. So say it's depression, for example, and you've done mind training before a depressive episode. Okay, not don't start in the middle of the depressive episode unless you have tons of mental space, perspective, and objectivity, which most people don't when they're suffering. On, so you've done your work on a good day, now it's a bad day. On the bad day, you remember your good day work and you think this depression is compounded 
by my resistance to it. Step one, overcome resistance to it and decide to make it voluntary. Yeah, just like if you are helping someone move house and you're picking up boxes and you're moving them into the truck, you can get tired and grumpy if you feel obliged, if you feel like you have to, if you feel like you're taken for granted. But it, that same exact physical activity can be joyful if you think, wow, I'm so glad I can help them. Gosh, they really needed it. They couldn't afford to hire movers. And also I'm a bit out of shape. So this is making me stronger. The same exact activity might have a suffering element. But when you're in the right headspace, the resistance isn't making it worse. The re yeah, the resistance always makes it worse. And when you get the resistance down, the suffering you have actually decreases organically, naturally, without forcing it. So then you think everyone else who is experiencing physical hardship, I take on their suffering. You can't take it from them. It's a mental attitude. But by adopting that mental attitude, it makes you much braver and more expansive. And it might be that you get more energy and mental space and your tiny little everyday mission of helping someone move house, you think, actually, I have more energy than I thought. I'll be the one that goes and gets everybody pizza. I'll be the one that dusts afterwards. Like you wind up doing more than you anticipated because more mental space and physical resiliency is opened up to you. So by taking on the suffering of others, you actually wind up facilitating more support for others, even in that very moment. So they're simple ideas on one sense, but easy to misunderstand. So I'm guessing that um, you're combining the ideas of universal responsibility with the ideas of Tonglen, although there might be a, another practice that's related that I haven't heard about. <laughs> so I hope that, okay. does that answer your yeah. question? Yes, yes. I, um, yeah, the taking responsibility, I think that, that the word that helps me to understand taking responsibility for your, um, for your state. Yeah. And yeah and and being brave and stop resisting it and being afraid of more of it yeah and in a way yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. thank you don't let your suffering be contagious <laughs> step one <Yeah. laughs> two things thank you very much just in this brief time for your clarity I, I do appreciate it so much it's amazing um one of the tools i use uh, in addition to some of the ones you've mentioned is when things are coming at me and they have done in, in the last few years quite heavily I get very tight mm -hmm. and the way I can loosen up is to see this as negative karma ripening in other words to see this as just military you know my my karma ripening and and this is fine this you mm -hmm. know this is an opportunity to clear that negative karma how does that come into the mix please that is kind of the that's the first step of the work of looking at how you relate to karma is working on the fact that this is the past and now it's ripening now and it's exhausting itself, it's finishing. If I don't want more of the same, I need to respond well. And you know, it's just negative karma ripening. And then your conclusion is, therefore I need to practice ethics because ethics are the basis of not creating more negative karma. But now with this bodhisattva path, we're taking that, we're not losing that, we're adding. And what we're adding is not only do I want to bear my own suffering well, I want to bear other people's suffering well. And actually I want to use both my suffering and their suffering as fuel for the path to enlightenment. So when I see the wheel of sharp weapons returning, yes, ethics, but also bodhicitta. And what's more is when you're reading about these and you realize they're naming things that are universal. I am not unique. <laughs> I am unique, but not really, <laughs> right? It's just variations on a theme. And I mean, that verse, right? It was written in the 10th century. And we think, oh, depression's a new modern issue. No, it's not, <laughs> right? In a way, it can be reassuring that the human condition has been similar or the same. The details have been different. Also, there are strategies to overcome it. So you start really looking at the pain in your life not as just something to bear gracefully and address with ethics, but something that part of you wants. You yeah, think, I see it's a purification. 
you see it as purification, absolutely do that. But then you add to it, understanding suffering deeply helps me understand the human condition and it increases my compassion. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just, it's layering on what you already know with more Mahayana motivation. And, and you already know this from your life that if you've had a particular kind of suffering, worked it out, moved through, finished it, I don't know, say you had like, epic credit card debt when you were in your 20s because you just were in your 20s and you made silly choices and then you spent decades paying it off and there was all sorts of like grief and angst about it and you finally found a good financial planner that helped sort you out and you got your budget organized and now you have a friend with epic credit card debt that they're dealing with don't you feel sympathy just like no effort whatsoever you're like oh my god i know that pain yes what can i do I know a guy, right? You're like, you're right in there with support because you relate. So with all of our suffering, we can try not to lose the lesson of it and how we can use it to open ourselves to others. Because if you haven't dealt with your own suffering, you've just kind of pushed it away. Then when you meet with other people who have a similar suffering, it triggers you. Yeah, and you either get too helpful because you can't bear to hear it because it's a painful sort of trigger or you block it and push it away and pretend it's not happening or any number of neurotic things happen if you haven't dealt with your own version of it so everyone's life details will be specific to them but the core issues are very similar so knowing yourself well immediately means you don't bring all this emotional baggage to helping other people you can just sit with their suffering and not be reactive. Yeah, and then if there is something you can do to help, that will be more apparent. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah. Oh, hi there, Venable Yanta, thank you so much. Um, I have the camera off most of the time, but I'm listening attentively. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Um, still for, trying to formulate a question, but I'm, I'm quite new to this text. Um, but when I was reading it, I kept thinking of ethics and like the Bodhisattva vows in particular. So I wondered, is there a way to connect the two that the text may help us review vows or stay connected with our ethics as well? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> it's, it, it's Bodhisattva ethics, you know, so it's not ethics because you don't want to suffer in the future. It's ethics because you don't want to suffer in the future and you don't want to cause suffering in the future and you want to help other people not cause suffering in the future and may all of that lead to the great awakening. So the Bodhisattva vows elevate your ethics. And when you're looking at what are good ways to help me stay mindful of my ethics? What can you do to stay actively present with them and to not kind of slip? is that whenever there is suffering, you view it as like a mindfulness bell that reminds you to practice bodhisattva ethics. Yeah. And then you go, oh, this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning. Like for example, there's one of the verses that talks about like dealing with criticism. So it's, it's helping you understand how to deal with criticism on one level. And then on the other level, you go, oh, the first bodhisattva vow is to refrain from praising myself and belittling others ha huh, relationship right <laughs> right so in, you know in that kind of way it just kind of pings you back into oh i'm so glad i have bodhisattva vows i better keep those little suckers well <laughs> yeah yeah so that definitely they go together perfectly yeah all right so that's the wheel um we'll come back to the wheel if there's more issues around karma we can come back to the wheel in more depth but uh before we kind of go back to karma, I'll just kind of introduce you to the rest of the main themes of the text, because there's a lot of repetition of themes. And once you have your head around it, then it's really smooth and in the flow. So, and then the poetry won't throw you, it will inspire you, theoretically. Okay, so how to think, what is happening now relates to the past. How I respond creates the future. That's just an example of how to think there'll be more to it and much more bodhicitta with it. It's just kind of getting us used to the wheel idea. So then the little opening stanza um, right after the title is, I pay heartfelt homage to you, Yamantaka. Your wrath is opposed to the great Lord of death. 
So in this little opening stanza, before we even get to verse one, there's a few things to unpack. What is a heartfelt homage? Who is Yamantaka? What is wrath? And who is the great Lord of death? Some of these are obvious, some of them aren't. So heartfelt homage is like a prostration or a show of respect or a thought of gratitude and respect kind of combined. And the purpose of it is like many of you have heard me say, you become receptive to what you respect. So we're, who are we receptive to and respecting? Yamantaka. Yamantaka is a highest yoga tantra deity and he is a wrathful highest yoga tantra deity. And wrath in Buddhism does not mean anger. Wrath means an appearance of extreme anger with a motivation of pure compassion. It's an intimidation of negative states of mind. We want to scare <laughs> negative states of mind. We don't want to scare ourselves or be harsh towards ourselves or other people, but we do want to overcome the enemy of the negative states of mind. So your wrath, your intimidating energy, opposes the great Lord of death. The great Lord of death is Yama. So Yama is the Lord of death, but it means karma and disturbing emotions. Yamantaka means the slayer of the Lord of Death. What slays the Lord of Death? Wisdom and method, or ultimate and relative bodhicitta in this context. So Yama you've seen in the Wheel of Life picture that's outside most Dharma centers or right inside the door, that um, he's holding that Wheel of Life that has the 12 links of dependent arising around the rim, the six realms in the pie slices, upper realms, lower realms, and then the three poisons at the core. So the scary monster is Yama. So uncontrolled death, the Lord of death, right? Uncontrolled death is from karma and disturbing emotions. If we didn't have karma and disturbing emotions, we wouldn't have uncontrolled death. So the outer Yama is this like so-called malevolent being living under the earth in the south who seeks to harm sentient beings. So a devilish like creature who has strongly habituated their mind to negativity over many, many eons and actively seeks to harm sentient beings. Now you can think of this Yama as metaphoric or like a folk story, or you can think of it in more literal terms, but the outer Yama is the least important. Least important is outer Yama, okay? So inner Yama is the real demon. This is longing desire. So it's the craving and the grasping that perpetuate the wheel of life or samsara, uncontrolled rebirth, which leads to death. So longing desire is what perpetuates the wheel of life together with all the other negative states of mind. If we were to say what quote started samsara, cyclic existence, uncontrolled rebirth, what started it was ignorance, but there is no start because beginningless time. But when we look at this chart, the start here, ignorance leading to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so from ignorance, then you develop desire for things that seem to support that false view of self and you become aggressive and have aversion towards things that seem to harm that false idea of self. So if we could work on our desire and the craving and grasping that flows from it, we could start to end death or start to end this inner yama. Then there's a secret yama, which is that subtle dualism that is present even when the seeds of suffering are quote, burnt. This refers to the imprints that exist until full enlightenment. Okay, so some of you newer students might not know about the five paths and understand about the process and the progress towards enlightenment. Um, so just put a pin in that, we might come back to it later. But the secret Lama, excuse me, the secret Yama is the more subtle dualism. So who is Yama? Yama is really us and our negative states of mind and ignorance. Destroying yama is not destroying the self. Destroying the yama 
is destroying our karma and negative emotions, which are why we have uncontrolled death. So what we need is to be Yamantaka. Okay, we need to be Yamantaka. And this is just the top of young Yamantaka. He has nine faces. He also has 34 arms and 16 legs and has a giant halo of flames. But until you have highest yoga tantra, it's best not to look at those images, even though they're fully accessible online. Say to yourself, I will wait until I have the empowerment. But the essence is, I need to be Yamantaka. I need to be the slayer of the Lord of Death. The interpretive meaning of that is the embodiment of the union of wisdom and method. The definitive meaning of Yamantaka is ultimate bodhicitta itself. So bodhicitta in the mind of someone who's realized emptiness directly. And he's the wrathful emanation of Manjushri whose sword of wisdom cuts ignorance. So you probably know Manjushri. Manjushri is just the lower tantra form of highest yoga tantra, Yamantaka. Okay, so the name of this work, The Wheel of Sharp Weapons, effectively striking the heart of the foe. The first stanza, I pay homage to you, Yamantaka. Your wrath is opposed to the great Lord of Death. So the example of how not to think is, if I want to stop uncontrolled birth, aging, sickness, and death, I need to be passive about my current conditions and just accept everything difficult that happens. Maybe I should even seek out more suffering. No, not that, <laughs> okay? And the example of how to think is, if I want to stop uncontrolled birth, aging, sickness, and death, I need to stop the causes and to purify previously created causes, okay? These are just examples. There's many ways to think, but this is this first little section. So before we get into peacocks and poisons, did you want to clarify anything about Yama and Yamantaka? He'll come up more later in the text, but because the text starts with a fit, I thought we should start with just kind of a, a quick overview. The, the concepts of Yama and Yamantaka, how do they sit? Lord of death, slayer of the Lord of death, both are really just coming from your own mind in the deeper, more nuanced sense. Is that making sense? Okay. Great. <laughs> Great. All right, peacocks and poison is a continuous theme throughout the whole text, but the essence is really talked about mostly in the beginning. So the idea is that you're transforming what could weaken you into what can beautify or strengthen you. So the first verse says, in the jungles of poisonous plants strut the peacocks, though medicine gardens of beauty lie near. The masses of peacocks don't find gardens pleasant, but thrive on the essence of poisonous plants. So there's this idea that Peacocks, the animal, are able to eat all sorts of poisonous things that normally would kill other animals, but it doesn't kill peacocks. It actually makes the color of their tail more and more lustrous and vibrant and gorgeous. So of course, I have Googled this many times to see, is this true? Can, can peacocks really eat poison? Does it really make their feathers more beautiful? The jury is still out, but many scientists say, mm, probably not. Um, but it is true that they can apparently eat some things that other animals can't eat and it does make them more healthy. So the literalness aside, the premise is if we're going to be the peacock, if we're going to be the bodhisattva, we need to change the way we think of hardship and stop kind of chasing pleasure gardens of medicinal plants to stop kind of chasing holiday adventures and to say, actually, the real work is done in the hardship. The holidays are just kind of a symptoms relief of samsara. They're not getting me out of samsara. And also all of the planning and craving and seeking involved with them keeps me more tightly engaged with my longing desire and all of my attachments. So it is not saying you can't enjoy beauty. What it's saying is you can find beauty anywhere. Okay, so like think of some, I don't know, eccentric artist 
and you've been dragged along to an art exhibition of some eccentric artist, and they have chosen to take pictures of a very poor and destitute inner city. And they've chosen to take a picture of like an electricity pole that's all filled of complicated wires and it's all kind of like the, the power converter is all rusted and it's sort of, you know, India-ish. Yeah, and there's like a, a monkey sitting on it and it's just like dirty and rusty and gross. And the artist has chosen to frame it in such a way, click, beautiful lighting, you know, really thought about the angle. And now it's framed in a museum or, you know, sort of a gallery. Now it's art, right? It's, you've just chosen to take a snapshot of something. You've chosen to put a frame around it. You've hung it on a wall and you've said it is art. Now it's art, it's beauty. But if you were walking around on the street, you'd be like, wow, that electricity pole looks dangerous. I hope no one dies. Mm, India, come on, regulation, zoning, right? So you can choose to take a picture and frame anything as beauty from a certain perspective. This is something that we already know. It's something that we can choose to be in alignment with when we're in a good mood and we want to. Like if a friend is taking you somewhere that they say is really important. Have you had this happen, right? Where like a friend is saying, oh, you have to go on this hike, you guys. It's so beautiful, it's so beautiful. And then you go on the hike and at first you think, yeah, trees and stuff like every other hike. I mean, it's great, but why so special? But because you love your friend, you try to find ways to make it special. You try to see it through their eyes. You try and understand how there can be beauty, profundity, uniqueness in this moment. And then so there is, right? It's like, it's not anything in and of itself, but you can make it so through the power of your mind. You know, or like when you're traveling and everything is kind of entertaining and quaint because it's different. But if you live there your whole life, it'd be boring and you'd take it for granted. It's the same stuff. It's how you're looking at it. So that's one surface of the mind training. And then it goes even further to say, seek out the hardest parts, the most poisonous parts, the hardest relationship, the most difficult physical thing going on with you, your hardest mental state to work with and say, these I'm going to eat happily. These are going to be the things that make me beautiful and strong. Does it make sense, this framing? Yeah. So again, these are quiet, private, inner conversations that you don't necessarily share with everyone because they don't have the context to know what you mean. You just wind up sounding like you're living in a kind of Pollyanna rose-colored glasses land. You start to sound like one of those positive thinking gurus who ignores the suffering of humanity or a, you know, overly chill surfer dude who says, it's all good, it's all good. And you're like, no, it's not. You know, this is a quiet inner conversation to help you reframe your experience into everything being enriching and deepening. Yeah, but you know, watch how you frame it to others because they may not understand unless they have the same context. Okay, so we'll have a little um, 10 minute break. Yeah, um, come back at 11.15 UK time. And uh, we'll start the next session with uh, questions and stuff. So 10 minutes. <laughs> 